Hi there, welcome everybody. My name's Scott Meyer with Artist Network and this is Drawing Together. So we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. We take time out of our busy lives to challenge ourselves with a new subject each week designed to help us grow and improve our skills in particular ways. So if you're new, you're gonna to wanna to know that this is all about us just taking time, again, to draw, um, share our ideas, uh, share our different approaches, ask questions. Um, so please feel free to use the chat to ask any questions of me or anybody in the audience, share your thoughts about drawing or art in general. Um, if you are following along, you're gonna to wanna to know that the reference image is in the description below. So you'll find a link to that. And you will also find a link to the show page on artistnetwork.com where you can share your work when you're done. So we love to see your work. There were some fantastic drawings. The Michelangelo copy uh, seemed to be a really, um, really helpful exercise for a lot of you. I haven't had a chance to respond to all of them, but I have seen them all. They are amazing. So thank you so much for sharing those. Um, the, the goal for today, we're drawing vases today, right? So um, as you could probably tell by the title, um, but we're working on black paper today with white chalk. So let me show you what the image is here. I'm gonna switch over to the screen here. Um, so this is what we're working on. Again, that image below me, you'll find in the chat. You'll find a link to that. So feel free to bring that up and draw. Um, and I chose to work this way. It's been a long time since we've worked on black paper. Um, it's a great way to simply kind of challenge your, um, your traditional ways of working. If you don't typically work with white on black, um, it can reveal a lot about how you think about value relationships, structure, texture, and it's a great way to, to throw a wrench in the system, as it were, to shake things up. So that's what we're working on today because you have to think um, in both additive and subtractive ways. So when we're talking about additive drawing, we're actually adding material to the paper. When we're talking about subtractive drawing, we're, we're using the eraser to cut into it. But there's also an element of, um, of positive and negative space, right? So in this case, you know, if we're working on a, a white sheet of paper, for example, we'd be building up a lot of the black area and leaving a lot of the white on the page. We're gonna flip that. So the additive process now is the white area and we're gonna be really pushing the value range there um, and allowing the black paper to do a certain amount of work for us. And it also is a great way to um, become more sensitive to subtle value relationships. When we get accustomed to working on white sheets of paper, we kind of key everything to that. Um, we, we calibrate our understanding of values to that white paper. So any mark you make on a white sheet of paper is gonna feel darker than it actually actually is. Anything you add to the black sheet of paper is gonna feel lighter than it actually is. And what you're gonna notice is actually we're gonna be bringing in some black charcoal to help reveal the true value of this black sheet of paper. Again, we kind of calibrate to the, the value ranges. Um, and when we identify this sheet as black, by adding something that's even darker, it makes this dark sheet acquire a very specific value. So um, welcome everybody. Thank you all for chiming in. I love seeing where you're all viewing from. We get viewers from all over the world. So if you're new, shout out where you're viewing from. We love that. Anything you wanna tell about yourself, about the type of work you do, what you're kind of looking for, where you are in your artistic career, because this is really designed for everybody. Um, so. Again, welcome everybody. Let's get to it. So let's look at first the paper, since that's really the the big big difference here. I'm working with this. This is the Legion Stonehenge Aqua Black. So this is a cotton rag paper. As you know, if you've been watching for a while, I love this cotton rag paper. Um, Stonehenge is a great paper. They, it comes in both white and black. Um, as it says here, it's suitable for watercolor, pencil, crayon, all of this stuff. It's a great all-purpose drawing paper, um, and the the sizing in it helps to hold up as watercolor if you're, if you're curious about it. So that's what I have here. Um, for the drawing tools, I have, I do have a, this is my Primo um, 3B charcoal pencil. Um, I'm not gonna be using it a whole lot, but I have it ready in case I need it. Um, and then I just have two white uh, pencils, both by Generals. I have their charcoal white and then the pastel chalk. I kind of use them interchangeably. They they kind of give you a, a, a similar range in terms of values. Some of the white drawing materials are a little bit more translucent and may not get quite as bright. Uh, so that's something that we're gonna be dealing with here on the paper by revealing some of the black paper showing through 
the white, it affects that that value. So um, we're we're not going to be able to get as white here as a white sheet of paper. That's just not possible. Um, these I think are great materials to get you close to the way, uh, most of the way there. So um, other drawing materials, I have my blending stump. I have a piece of paper towel um, that looks really bright. The sun just um, the sun just kind of popped out of you know coming through the window and it's changing things a little bit. So um, I do have again my uh, blending stump. And my, my two erasers, I have my Derwent retractable eraser that I have used a razor blade to cut away at to give me a nice sharp kind of chisel point um, and my kneaded eraser. So fairly simple. Um, if you are kind of curious, you can go back through in the description below and you can find the, uh, the list of materials there. So again, you don't have to be drawing with the same materials I have. Many of you may not even have black paper. Um, but hopefully this gives you something to think think about. So if you're following along and using pen and ink or graphite, I think there's still a lot you can learn from this subject. In particular, I really like this um, the the quality of light. It's quite dramatic, which I thought lent itself to the the drama that can be inherent in working on on black paper here. So all right. Um, let me see. If anybody has any questions, if you type them in all caps, it's easier for me to identify them. But if I do miss a question, uh, please uh, pr please ask it again. Sometimes I just miss it. Sometimes the chat gets going and they they um, the, the questions by fly by very quickly. So, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to share your work, if um, we'd love to see your work on Artist Network. So you can actually share it on the link that, that's in the description below for this episode. Um, many of you share work that's somewhat related to this episode. Sometimes it's a painting um, or a work done in another medium um, or even from a you know, just a similar image or something that makes you think about this episode. So it doesn't have to be exactly this drawing or this subject. Uh, so feel free to to post your work on that in that uh, that thread and the link that's provided in the description below. All right. Oh, Jennifer, welcome from Trinidad in the West Indies. That's awesome. Um, there's an Arlene, yeah, saying that you've worked with um, black paper using colored pencils. That that sounds really awesome. I, I you know when you ever whenever you're working on the the, the black paper it can really make things dramatic. The challenge then is again the the translucency of many materials and there's a great range. Some materials are more opaque than others, um, but it, it can all be really uh, really awesome. Now the one thing that's going to come up as well is um, the. Uh, when I, I like to work on the black papers periodically, again, to kind of put my value ranges in check, I find myself over time increasingly becoming more biased towards a higher key image, you know, again, just kind of calibrating to the white surface. And so I keep having to put that in check and bringing everything down in value. Um, in particular, because when you have something that's dramatically lit like this, I have a tendency to go a little bit too strong on that, make that light brighter than it actually is. And when you check that, if you were to isolate that section of the photograph, you're going to realize that it's actually closer to a middle gray. It's lighter than the black, but it's closer to it. Because again, value is all about um, relationships. I'm going to start drawing as we go. So just using the side of the pencil, I'm going to be kind of just roughing in, getting some gestural work done. Um, but back to that point, Again, value is all about relationships. We understand um, and interpret a value based on its context. What are the values around it? We do the same with color. So um, when we have a dark surface like this, as I said earlier, anything, um, anything lighter than that dark surface is going to feel lighter than it actually is. And we're going to start to calibrate to it. We're going to start to assign these light areas as white and the black sheet as black but they're actually within that narrow, uh, kind of a narrower range than that. Um, uh, and Greg is, is uh, mentioning texture. That's a key element in this as well, which is gonna be fun. Um, there is a natural tooth to this paper that I'll be utilizing. Um, and in the preparatory sketch that I, had, uh, that I showed earlier, um, that was a key factor. Um, now, we're also gonna be really talking about light on this. Um, in particular, turning edges. 
those are those edges of, you know, of these objects that kind of fade into that background. Um, that's such an important aspect of drawing uh, figures, portraits especially, um, but really anything, uh, really paying attention to what's happening at those edges and turn those edges so it doesn't feel like it's um, quite as flat as um, it, it might be, especially when you're working with a portrait that where you're looking at somebody straight on, for example, you know, we're, we're, when we're drawing, we're working on a flat sheet of paper. So the, the challenge is to try to create a, a three-dimensional illusion. Or, or when we're drawing realistically, that becomes the challenge. Um, the, the way we handle those edges and the way we turn those edges really helps to enhance that illusion. Otherwise, um, you know, it can feel kind of uncomfortable to the viewer because it starts to feel like a, a flat mask. Um, so that's where, you know, when... In my approach to, to drawing is to think about drawing really as a set of decisions that we make, not a set of practice motions that we apply to a particular subject. So it's, it's about making decisions that we can apply to any subject, and that really frees us up to, to tackle anything that comes our way. Um, when we, if we take uh, a mindset where you know, drawing a particular subject requires certain practiced motions, it becomes fairly limiting. Um, so uh, we challenge ourselves with subjects like this because it opens doors for us with other subjects as well. So we can look at these vases and think, how would we apply this thinking and some of these ideas to a portrait or to a figure? So in this gesture, I'm not being super careful. I'm just getting stuff laid out Uh, and I'm thinking both linearly and in terms of shape. So what I mean by that is, you know, right here I'm indicating the, the left edge of the, the vase there. And then um, when I'm working with the broad side of the white charcoal, I'm building up that shape. And that's important for me to kind of work both at the same times or if anything, prioritize shape. Uh, because I interpret the, the proportions differently when they are solid shapes versus lines. It's going to kind of wipe this down, soften things up a little bit. I've got everything somewhat accounted for. Now, nothing is correct because I've only spent, you know, a few minutes working on this thing. And that's the, that's the expectation at this stage is to simply get information on the page and then we can continue to refine it. If you're, if you're, initiating your drawing with the mindset that you have to have it all worked out in your brain and map everything first, that's a lot of pressure. I can't handle the pressure, so I work this way, where I kind of feel it out throughout the process. I'm coming to a, a, a realization, a discovery about this subject through the act of drawing and allowing the drawing to emerge at the same pace as my understanding of the subject. So right now, I don't understand the subject very well, so my drawing is just a bunch of jumbles. I'm also looking at the subject through blurred eyes to help me identify them as kind of basic shapes. Um, one of the things I notice as these shapes that, you know, with a light coming in from this side, the left edges tend to be a little bit sharper than the right edges. It kind of as we turn around the volume of these forms, that there's a, a gradation of value transitioning into the black. Um, it's a little bit harder on the left side, a little bit more gradual on the right. So when I'm blocking things in, I'm working that into the process, letting things be a little bit more diffused. And I can do that by simply kind of lifting or, or flattening the, the pencil, just putting a little bit more pressure on the, the tip of the pencil and letting things kind of trail off, off to the right. And then we'll, we'll refine that further. Um, let's see. Uh, Lollipop Strawberry, this is a General's Pastel Chalk Pencil that I'm using. It actually has an eraser on it that I don't think I've ever really used, but they're great products. I think General's makes some really wonderful white charcoal. I'm actually going to I'm going to switch to this at some point. I kind of use them interchangeably because I don't spend enough time working with white to really appreciate the differences between them. Some are going to be a little bit more fugitive. They're going to kind of move around a little bit more easily than others. But um, let's see. 
Oh, then Susan, yeah, talking about working with Metal Point on black, really fun. The copper comes out copper color and silver is a silver tone. Yeah, black has a gr is a, a great way to reveal the true color of um, whether you're working on whatever material you're working with. Um, it does affect the way we interpret mass and volume, however. So that's why I like to think about it in terms of um, shape as I'm laying out the... Um, just some of these basic marks uh, because especially with with color if you have like thin black lines around a color it can sometimes kill the color you put the color on a black space and it's very different the, the thickness the amount of black uh, that's established in the context of the piece can impact how we um, interpret any color that's in that field all right so Let's see. Now I think I need to start mapping things a little bit. Um, so generally, my my drawings progress uh, in, a, in a in a series of decisions. This is what I outlined in my book. Uh, there's a link to that in the description below that'll come out in June. Um, kind of breaking down the drawing process and again into a set of decisions. The first decision is to get information on the page in the form of a gesture. We're simply reacting to the form without calculating a whole lot, but we're just we're putting pieces on the of the puzzle on the page, and then we're going to move those around until the image locks together. So we're going to take time to gather information about the subject, and as we do that, it's going to become increasingly more specific. Um, so the next stage um, is kind of calculating a little bit more. So uh, I'll be using tools like comparative measuring, angle sighting, uh, plumb lines, horizontal guides. Those are the main ones to help us kind of refine the proportions. Um, so where do I want to begin? I think I want to begin th – this this vase here is, is kind of the central focal point, but it's not placed in the center. And I like that. Um, so I'm going to look at this relationship. Where is the center of the paper? I've got a larger version of the reference off here to the right. So the center of the paper should align with around this section of the vase. So not right here in the center. If I, if I lightly draw the central axis of the form I've already drawn, this should be about the center of the paper, which actually is, is right, about, right about there. Okay, I got, got a little lucky there. Um, so if this becomes somewhere in the center. Uh, what I'll be looking at doing then is placing the left edge of the vase on this side, just to the left of center. Um, and at this stage, I can do uh, use angle sighting. If you're new to that term, what an angle sighting is, is you're, you're using your pencil here to, to help visualize the angle of your, your targeted section of your reference. Um, so if I close one eye and align this pencil. I'm, I'm viewing it directly on top of the reference image. I'm closing one eye, finding an angle, bringing it over, and I'm visualizing it directly on top of the, uh, the, on top of the drawing. I can compare the basic angle of the, uh, you know, each section of the vase. Uh, I can compare that from the reference to the drawing here. So it's hard to hard to talk and calculate at the same time. <laughs> That's what I know is where my, my words fumble is in the areas where in which I'm calculating. Um, I'm going to just do kind of an, a visual assessment of the size of the space. So this becomes the negative space. This becomes positive space. Positive space is anything that is, you know, the subject that you're targeting. The negative space is the shape created by that subject in the areas around it. Um, this is a very identifiable negative space here under in that that hole in the the handle there. Um, uh, Michelle saying, "I notice you use a pencil like a paintbrush." I do. Yeah, there's a, a fairly painterly approach to drawing that I take, um, and becomes both additive and subtractive. On my paintbrush, I typically hold towards the end, and it allows me to control pressure a little bit better. So it also helps engage the um, the side of the pencil more. I, I do like a grip like this, especially with a longer pencil. I'll use, I call this a modified overhand grip. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a modified tripod grip. So if I wedge it between my fingers here, I can, um, I can give myself some stability and kind of float the side of the pencil on the page. But because this is getting shorter, I can't quite lay that down as much as I'd like. Um, yeah, that, 
the light's really bright out there now. We got a good snowstorm blowing up here in Fort Collins. Um, all right. I want to be really careful here. There's a transition into black where I, I know the edge of the vase to be, but I have to ask myself, can I see it? Um, I get really tripped up in areas like this. And this is the difference between uh, awareness and perception, right? There's um, what are we actually able to see and what do we think is there? What do we, what do we know to be there um, despite the lack of optical evidence? Um, so I, I'm kind of giving myself some rough marks to suggest where the edge of that vase is, but I, I want to be really mindful of the fact that I can't see it there. And I don't want to articulate something that I can't see. Um, let's, and that's really tricky over on this side too, because symmetry is an, is an essential element in a drawing like this. Um, and what's going to throw off the symmetry is the fact, again, that we have a harder edge here than we do over here. So the visible edge on this side that transitions into that dark background feels like it shifts this off center a little bit and it, it affects the overall symmetry. Um, and I want to look at things like this. I've got this angle here. I want to see it that it matches that. But not only does it match the angle, but does it match the, the correct placement on the page? So what I have forming here is a line that's a, a bit higher than over here. So I need to level that out. Um, you can use a, a horizontal guide there to help give yourself uh, some orientation. And I can bring that down just a little bit. Um, with, the, with the central axis visualized, you can also kind of take measurements from left to right to make sure that things are forming symmetrically across there. Now, I'm not, I'm not super worried about my values at this point. I'm mostly concerned with really thinking through some of the measurements that we're, that we're seeing. And then this handle kind of comes in a little bit from where I had initially suggested it. Um, and at this stage, I, having soft edges is more valuable than sharp lines at this stage. Um, it's going to help in representing that, that turning edge, really capturing that turning edge. Uh, now, the, the horizontal lines, if you're trying to get the, the, the opening of the vase correct, I'm going to move this over here. You see I have this bar that's raised up, and I have the sheet of paper that's parallel to it. So everything's kind of squared up. Um, I can use this as a guide. I can feel where this is rubbing against my arm. I can lock my wrist, my fingers, um, lock that pencil and use that as a way to help establish something that's horizontal. Um, you can also do it from the top here. One of the, one of the tools I employ is to, I'm using, I'm using my fingernail here, locking it in on the top. Let me see if I can do, if I can show that. So it's, it's kind of resting here on the top, finding the distance that I want with my fingers like this, finding that distance, locking my fingers along that top of the page, and I can just use that as a way to scribe a line that's horizontal. You know, it's quite intense. I'll have to clean that up later. But if you're working on trying to create a nice horizontal edge, um, those are a couple ways that I do it. Uh, now, we know the opening here to be cylindrical. You know, it's a circular opening, but we're looking across it, across the top of the cylinder, so it's largely horizontal. Um, and there might be some slight variations because it's a textured um, a ceramic mug or vase, but the, um, I think for all intents and purposes, I'm going to treat it like a, like a, just a straight line. You can let your lines run long. So I'm just kind of mapping things out. Now, as I, as I look at the shape of this, this top part here, I can use angle sighting to adjust this, this angle here. I kind of had it too, too steep, kind of straighten it up a little bit. 
Um, now there's there are a few bends. There's this subtle bend at the top. There's this longer section, then it's flat here. And then looking at the relationship between this and the handle, I need to adjust something here. So the question is, is this too short? Do I need to move this up to accommodate the shape of the handle? Or is the handle too tall? Now, one of the way, the way I can check that is I can check the width, compare that to the height of this top here. And what I determine is if I, I have to kind of imagine where the right side of that, that opening is, that top is. If I take that measurement and I swing it down like this, and it puts me right about here, which is right at the point at which it starts to really kind of transition into this, this curve here. Now, I'm intentionally breaking those curves down into shorter straight sections. It's going to lead to a more specific curve than trying to capture this one S-curve perfectly. We, we understand the symmetry on those curves a little bit differently when we think of them as straight sections that are interconnected versus one continuous curve. Um, so that's what I'm thinking about here. So if I take a horizontal guide here, I can use that to visualize where the turn is going to be here. And it looks like then I, what I need to do is ultimately bring, bring that handle down. And, I, and I'm kind of switching back and forth between thinking about the center of the, the, you know, the central axis of this handle to then thinking about the inner contour or the outer contour, I mean. So I'm trying to visualize the sections here. Like this is this section here is almost vertical, but it's not quite. It kind of leans in a little bit. There's a bend here, and then it becomes almost horizontal here. So it's I'm getting closer to refining it, but I'm not locking it in. And in part because, again, we, we have such soft edges, and I need to continually analyze the edges that I see versus the edges that I know to be there that that are literally obscured by the the darkness there. Uh, I know the top of this vase over here to be kind of somewhere between these lines here in terms of height. It's above this handle but below the top here. Uh, and then you can see with these you know, these white areas, these light areas, that there's no sharp edges on the left or right sides, just these areas of, of light. So as I'm, as I'm working my way down, kind of checking in where I am relative to this central vase, still using the side of the, the pencil, and I'm, I'm intentionally kind of lifting off on this side, lifting off on this side, and really observing how subtle the light is on this, this face back in here. Now, I'm going to move over. Um, oh, okay, I do want to get to some of the questions here. Um, yeah, the, I'm, I'm going to continually check the, um, the vase here. Um, Lynn D uh, says, it seems wider at the left side. I think you're you're talking about this vase. If not, then let me know. Um, that's that's part of what this this show is all about. So if you're making any observations about my drawing, my feelings won't get hurt. Throw them out there. We're just we're that's why we're drawing together. You all have helped me through a lot of tricky points um, in in the drawing, and you'll see things that I don't see in my own work. And that's that's why it's helpful to share those those observations and it can be helpful to have a creative a creative partner of your own that when you're working can give you that type of feedback um, you know of course be kind of gentle with it um, but those observations are incredibly valuable so um, that's what we're here for uh, so I'm right now I'm looking at placing 
the top of this vase over here, um, observing how there's a stronger bright um, spot here that kind of trails off. Um, there is, there's some interesting play between positive and negative space in this section here where we have the lighter pot uh, or vase here with, and then there's a darker shadow on the lip of this one that defines a very subtle kind of negative shape. And when I'm filling in an area like this using the side of the pencil, I'm constantly rolling, rotating the pencil as I go. Um, that helps to prevent, you know, flat spots in the drawing. Change up the direction of your marks. And I, I think multiple passes of with light pressure is preferable to me versus kind of a heavy pressure and getting it done with fewer layers. Use the palm of my hand to kind of spread this out. I'm not worried about preserving edges. You can still see them. And we'll use an eraser to clean up that edge. Um, now I know an edge to be here, but I can't quite see it. Uh, one thing to note in in your your reference, the the color calibration and the brightness of your monitor will play a role in what you're able to see and what and not see. So um, so for example, when I look at this, I can't really see an edge there. If I look at it at just the right angle, it feels like I can see this vertical edge, but I, I just need to be a little bit careful again. Ask myself, do I see that or do I know it to be there? And so we'll do some subtractive drawing with the eraser in a little bit, which again, the benefit to working with white on black periodically is that it, it inverts the typical process where on a white sheet of paper, these dark forms I would be building up. In this case, I'm actually erasing down. Um, all right, Leslie, looks like you'll um, watch and draw the replay. Um, let's see, can you use any equipment tools to draw on black paper? I, I guess so. You know, I don't, honestly, I don't draw on on black paper a whole lot. Um, so I don't really know what the limitations are. Um, but I, I imagine, I mean, it, I know there are even, you know, watercolor artists that work on black paper. Uh, there are, you know, we've talked about colored pencil. I think pastel works great on black. Uh, I know quite a few artists like Christine Ivers that works with on black paper with pastel, which is, really wonderful effects. Um, and I have seen uh, some pen and ink work done with like lighter colored pens and markers on black paper, but I, I don't know the specifics. So if anybody works in that medium, it would be a great time to share what your, um, what your thoughts are on, on that. Okay. So just kind of roughing out the form. This handle's a little bit tricky. Uh, I'm gonna talk through that a little bit more after I get this put in, kind of established a little bit more. Um, so I haven't really done any measuring it with, with this yet. Um, I'm just kind of giving myself a little bit more a structure, but I'm, I'm reacting to initial observations about where these forms are relative to this. So this becomes my anchor, and I start to build those relationships around that. The, the danger in that, though, is that if I've drawn this too large, it's going to push everything off the page. Uh, so I have to do some kind of quick check-ins with, with this. And what, I, what I'm ultimately doing is, you know, I need to look at the... the the width to the height of this vase. We can see just a little bit of light catching the bottom of this vase. Um, but look how close that is to the bottom of my paper. When we look at the reference photo, there's a little bit more room. So there's, there's just more space. What I've done is I've scaled everything up and I'm kind of pushing out towards the edges. 
uh, th now I have a decision to make. Do I want to correct it and really make this uh, match the, uh, the reference photo or let it be? And I'm going to choose to let it be, uh, just really mostly for the sake of time, but I'm, I'm also because I, I don't know as if it's really going to add anything significant to the drawing. There is something kind of interesting about kind of zooming in just a little bit, making things a little bit more um, kind of constrained by the edges of the paper. So we'll play it out. And sometimes I, when I don't really know why I'm doing something, um, but I like I know, you know, I know, for example, that the scale of everything is off relative to the reference. I don't know if I like it or if I don't. Um, and I'd rather lead by making decisions that I can be declarative about, that I, that I can say, yes, this is why I'm doing it. If, if not, I'm going to let it sit for a little bit and see where it goes. And maybe throughout the drawing process, it'll re reveal something that makes me say, you know, I made the wrong decision. I need to, I need to shrink everything or I need to move things around a little bit. Um, but what I want to try to avoid is a, a habit I've lived with in the past, which is to constantly kind of second guess and then change things and change things back and then kind of move things around. I've, over time, I've learned to let things sit until I've gathered a bit more information to make decisions about things like composition and, and such. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. I want to try to visualize the left side of this here. Um, this definitely feels too too wide here. But before I do that, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to angle sight to help me a little bit with the proportions. So I'm going to be looking at the gap between these two uh, forms here. To help me place that, I'm actually going to look at this angle. I'm going to identify where the, the top right of this form is and where the top left of this opening. I'm going to find an ang that angle and see where I'm at. And if I, if I use this as the anchor, let's say I, I feel like this is correct here, and, and I find the angle relative to the reference, what it does is it creates a line that, that really runs down here. So this point here in the opening should actually be down here. And then I can, I can use some other tools to help evaluate that. I'm just kind of smudging with the palm of my hand. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Um, so in that way, I noticed that there was a gap, that there was a, something out of alignment in the, this shadow underneath the opening here, that lip. It was too big. So then um, before I moved it, I, I tried to gather a little bit more information so that I um, I kind of sec, uh, you know, checked the assumptions I might be making because my first instinct was to actually bring this part up and leave the opening where it was. And then in that process, I found out, found out I was wrong. And now I can really see how much of the, the reference image I've cropped by, by doing that. Um, I can also now run a plumb line here, see where this is relative to the vase, it's just about in line with the right side of the handle here. And I can draw a, a horizontal guide across here, see where that intersects with this form. So for me, measuring all begins with uh, just observing relationships between the forms. Uh, uh, now I can, I can also kind of double check. If I can visualize the, the width across here, kind of at the, just about the widest point, I can compare that to the height. So what, I, what I've indicated here is that taking this width at this widest point, by turning it vertically, aligning it with the bottom of the vase that I've identified, it puts me right in line with the the bottom of that handle. Now I'm going to compare that to the reference. And that's right. Actually, it worked out, which I did not expect. <laughs> so that could be a good tool for you here. Kind of identify the left and the right sides of this face, take that measurement, turn it vertically, um, and it should equal this distance here from this point down to the bottom. Um, 
Oh, Leslie is asking, uh, the charcoal pencil that I have is a soft one. This is a 3B, so that's a fairly soft one. Um, let's see. Oh, white. Peter asked about using white gouache. That is that that brings back so many memories of my um, my freshman year at art school. I did a ton of drawing with white gouache on black paper. God, that's been a long time. It's a it's fantastic to to give that a shot. Um. um Susan is saying, I've been using the curve technique in some of the recent drawings, and it is really helpful. Awesome. Um, Cindy is saying, if you use colored pencil on black paper, try them out on a scrap piece first because some colors don't show up. Yeah, so there's a translucency. I don't work enough in colored pencils, but I've, I've worked with colored pencil artists to learn that there's so much more to them than I had to realize. There's different mediums. Some are more waxy. Some are oil-based. Um, and there's a translucency to them that's inherent in in them that is going to be impacted by black paper. Um, and that's why some some colored pencil artists specifically use white in order to create brighter um, colors, more vibrant colors. So that that white paper underneath is, it allows that that color to glow more. Or you know you kind of key everything down and use that black paper to create contrast contrast to push it up. Um, uh, Brenda is saying the smaller vase seems too tall to me. That would be, yeah, I need to, um, let's see. Yeah, this, I didn't, I, there's a, a suggestion of the form over here. Um, this is funny. There's a, <laughs> there's a spot on my monitor in front of me that I keep thinking is part of the drawing, but it's not. When I look at the larger one over here, um, and it's that's throwing me off a little bit, but I, I will need to kind of refine this curve. So areas that I need to refine a little bit further, I'm going to smudge out a little bit. Little bit. I'm not going to erase them entirely. I'm just going to soften those edges and come back and refine them. But I feel like at, at this point, I'm at a, a good place to move on to the next phase. Um, what I'm going to do now is kind of refine the areas that have sharper edges. So I'm going to be looking for those. And I can start here. I think this is the most identifiable sharp edge. Um, and when I do this, I'm going to intentionally use a lighter touch than I kind of feel is necessary. Um, what can sometimes happen, especially when in a vase like this, the, the highlight is going to be placed somewhere right in here, not right up against that edge. There's a value shift that can be very difficult to see because with this edge being adjacent to that dark background, it's creating simultaneous contrast that makes this feel lighter than it actually is. So one of the ways you can really see the value relationships more clearly is to use an indirect gaze and use a soft gaze. So squint your eyes, let your eyes lose focus. And what you're going to do is look to the left or the right of this area, but put your awareness on that highlight. And in particular, try to see the relationship between this highlight here and then this value shift. And you can see it a little bit more clearly if you're not looking directly at it. Um, so we've talked about this before. When you really bring sharp focus to your vision and you target a specific area, the value range is distorted to enhance clarity and detail. And so you actually become more, um, more of a keen observer of value relationships when you look just to the left or right of the area that you're targeting. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to sharpen up some of these edges, but again, not with a, a lot of pressure. And to kind of show where I'm at with the pressure, this is, this is going to feel lighter in value than it actually is. If I go like this and I really bear down, look how bright that is, right? So I'll just leave that there for context. I can always go back through and brighten things up. Um, but right now, it's more about sharpening the edge. And the way I'm doing that is I'm looking at the form, working from the center of the form up to that edge, and kind of feathering back out. So laying the pencil down kind of softening. You can change up the direction of your marks. Uh, if you're not sure what direction to make your marks, use a circular mark. Um, and I'm going to go through and try to add a little bit more specificity 
to this edge. Now, the, and this edge here is one that specifically has kind of a harder, um, a harder, sharper edge. It's a little bit soft because I've wiped it down and I've blurred that edge, but I'll bring back the eraser in a little bit to add even more specificity to it. And now here we have these forms that overlap. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this vase directly in on top of this one. And then I'll use my eraser to carve that one back out. And, by, and so keeping my eyes out of focus when I'm doing all of this, it helps prevent um, the, the desire to uh, really get in there and manage that texture. And now, as we work up to the, the edge here, the, the, the top, I want to observe that where that this edge here starts to become more diffused. And we can sort of see it over on this side. And again, I, one of the things that I, I had, I was challenged by in the initial drawing, again, was my desire to draw what I know to be present in the vase, but I can't really see. Like I, I, I feel like I know exactly where the edge of the vase is here in the shadow, but I can't see it. So I'm just going to let that let that go. And then make sure I'm kind of lifting up as I go to soften that edge. We see a hard edge here. I figure out where to place that. We see a hard edge on, on the on the handle. It's harder at the top here at this section. Get a little bit more diffused towards the bottom. And then what we're going to notice is as we work around the handle, the, the, this top edge that is sharper becomes more diffused as we come around that curve. And then it's sharper on the inside of the curve here. So right now, again, I'm just thinking about the, the edges and not, not in absolutes, but just in terms of relationship. Is it harder or softer then? Is it sharper, more crisp, or is it more diffused? Um, we have... I want to double check symmetry here. It's a little bit sharper right in here, and then it gets diffused again. Um, and I'm trying at my best to not think about drawing a vase, but instead think about this as an abstraction. These are just shapes of value, and there's edges. There's some edges that are sharp and some that are diffused. And where do they belong with one another? Um, I gotta. I need to adjust that a little bit. This feels like it's too high. And as we come down here, it really kind of fades out. I'm going to bring a little bit of by, by smudging this out. I'm going to bring bring a little bit of this white chalk into that black paper. And that's going to help me, actually. I'll be able to erase out some of those darker shaded areas. Um, Benjamin Brown, I'd be happy to say hi to you. Um, let's see. OK. Um, yeah, if anybody knows you know, an artist that um, could benefit by you know, just drawing together with some people. Tell them about the show. We like to have new people. Um, let's see. Okay. I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm going to now bring out my eraser to crisp up some of those edges. One of the, the one of the things I need to be aware of right now is that 
Right now, these values are closer together than they're going to be at the end. Um, so uh, I, I need to kind of just keep that in mind and not let it influence my, my the way I build up these values. Actually, I'm going to bring out the, I'm going to use my kneaded eraser to lift, kind of getting close to that edge. So that this way it kind of preserves my um, my rubber eraser a little bit better. And I'm just using a little bit of pressure there to make sure I'm keeping this edge soft as I erase. And just kind of refining that form. So doing some subtractive drawing, thinking about the shape of the negative space. One of the things that's also happening is there, the way the light is catching it, um, the camera is catching glare that I'm not able to see from my perspective. So I need to keep looking up at the screen in front of me that captures that overhead camera. Um, Yeah, oh, um, Cindy, a great comment. The top of the handle should be rounded and not straight across. Yes. Um, as I was, I was just thinking that as I was erasing out, I'm like, I haven't been very specific with that. Um, and I noticed that it's, there's a more of a distinct slant here. So that's what I can start to correct with the eraser. Because I think I also made that handle too bulky. Uh, it was a really good observation. Uh, so I'm just using this to kind of refine some of the, the edges here. Uh, one thing to note about this paper, if you're using the same one, use the top <laughs> of the paper. I didn't do that with the first drawing, and it lifted some of the paper a bit more. There's kind of a, a better side to work on. That's the top side that that's revealed when you open up the pad of the paper. Okay. And now as I as I do that, I feel like there's a opportunity to refine this shape a little bit more. And we'll keep tweaking it as things come up. That's the hard part when we stare at something. When we really sit with a subject for a while, our our understandings of it actually get more and more distorted. Um, so it's helpful to just kind of work a little bit, move on to another area, and then come back to it. Um, uh, let's see. So now we're. I'm going to work on the this area here. So this is the part where it, it can be really, really challenging if you haven't worked on black paper this way. Now I'm erasing out areas where on a white sheet of paper I would be adding charcoal. So I'm looking at the shape of this, uh, the opening here, the lip. And I'm trying, I'm basically imagining that this eraser is actually a piece of charcoal. Uh, and I'm looking at this here is a fairly sharp edge. So I'm working both the positive space and the negative space. And so it's kind of sharper right in here. I feel like I overstated it a little bit. And then It's really quite diffused along in here. I'm just using my finger to kind of smooth, move things around a little bit. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna move away from that. Again, I'm just gonna kind of strike that area and then move away. Now, this form here, this lip curls away so it's actually sharper on this bottom edge of the lip 
than it is at the top. So I want to be careful not to make that, that top edge there too sharp. And I want to make sure I place this correctly. So what can I use as, I need to figure out what the, um, what the width of this top part is relative to the height. So what I, what I see here is that there's a bend, you know, from the, the top there. If I take that, this measurement here as one unit, I turn it, and then the width should be two units wide. And I don't quite have that. And I think I need to kind of do a combination of two things. Bring this up a little bit. Um, I'm going to work on that, that the point of contact where the handle is. It's a, kind of a sharper light area on the inside where it connects and then it diffuses away. Then there's a sharp edge here. Actually, it's a little bit more, slightly more vertical than what I indicated. And again, I'm going to kind of block this in a little bit more. That light kind of creates a bit of a triangular shape with a really soft edge, so I want to be careful there. Um, and then, yeah, this is a really diffused edge here. Again, I'm targeting areas that seem to have a sharp edge. There's a really subtle sharp edge here. And I, so I'm glad I have that white spot there to help me. Actually, I'm going to put a little bit more, another one over here, just to help me with the value relationships because I'm I'm calibrating again to the the value ranges, and I'm seeing these light areas as lighter than they actually are. Uh, and the next sharper edge is over here on this left side of the vase. Um, uh, Jane is asking, are you on Reddit by any chance? I've told a couple people there to come here. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for doing that. I'm not on Reddit. I know so little about Reddit, it's embarrassing. <laughs> so um, I, and there's no real excuse. It's been around forever. My kids are on it for various things. Um, and I know it's all over the place, but it's just something that's never worked into my, my world. But I should check it out. Um, uh, the paper, Leslie, this is, again, to, for the paper, especially if you're new, this is what I'm working on here. This is a Stonehenge Aqua Press Black. This is the 9 by 12, right? Yep, 9 by 12 right in here. Um, so, yeah, this is a great black paper if you haven't worked on it before. Um, Stonehenge, I think, in general, like, uh, is just a wonderful paper, and then this black one is, is particularly nice. Um, oh, yeah, Neurotic Nation, that looks like 9 by 12. Well done. That's a great observation. That's not easy to, see, to determine the, the proportions of paper based on really just the, I guess all you're really seeing is a pencil in my hand in there. Um, all right, so I need to move on to this one, this vase down in here. Um, oh, okay. Let's see. Yeah. So if, again, if anybody has any questions, let me know if, if you are new, what you're watching is drawing together. Um, my name is Scott Meyer. This is Artist Network. We do this every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. New subject every week um, designed to help us improve our skills. I need a I need a horizontal guide here just to help with the um, the the uh, axis of this ellipse so it doesn't fall off the page there. Kind of erase out that shadow a little bit. This is softer. Where are the hard edge? The hard edge is really just right in here. Again, just blocking in that value.
And then there's a bit of a harder edge here at the top of the lip here in the ellipse. So we'll dig into that a little bit more later. And then here, I think I want to indicate these stripes a little bit. I don't know, I think I really placed them 100% correct. But they're, what's difficult is I'm, I, and I don't know if this is true for all of you, but I know those these lines on that vase to be circular. They go around the form. And that's totally influencing how I view that shape. I, I see it, I feel it as having more of a curve than it actually does. And I find myself in this habit of kind of exaggerating the curve more and then having to correct it. And so one way to check that is to use your angle sighting and take your, your pencil, really align it with with that edge and it'll show you how much of a curve there actually is. So if I go like this, let me let me kind of drop this on here. If I go like this, you can see there should be a little bit of a a gap here on the at the center of that form. But it's almost horizontal. It's almost a horizontal line. And I feel like I've exaggerated that too much. And so I can I can massage that a little bit. It's all very very subtle. Um, all right. So now where am I at? All right. I need to. Oh, this is the the other sharp edge that I miss. So on the inside of this, it's a very light value. It's not catching a lot of light, but it's sharper on the inside than it is on the top. All right. Um, we have this kind of slight glow down in here. I drop that on. That's too much. Okay. Now, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? I'm going to try to lift off a bit more of this. Now, one of the things you can do, so right here, there's still some of that that charcoal that, I mean, the, 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 white, yeah, the white charcoal that's showing up. Um, I'm going to emphasize this a little bit more. I'm take, I have the now the 3B charcoal pencil. And you lay that on there. How does that show up? Yeah, you can really see now it changes the context of the black paper. Uh, I'm going to start from the, um, you know, from the, the center of this negative space and work my way up to the edge. I'm not going right to the edge yet. I'm just kind of building up some value. Adding a little bit of variety to the back there. And this is where I would really like to be able to turn the paper, but I can't because it's actually taped down. It's taped down on the back here. Um, so what I'm going to have to do is as I work up to the edge, what, what I try to avoid doing and filling in a negative space like this is to make obvious marks that are running parallel to the form. So we have this angle here on the vase. So I want to avoid marks that run parallel to that. Just because even if they are subtle, and but if they're visible, it can flatten out the space. I don't know if I can be, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that though. So what I need, I just need to be really careful when I'm coming up to that edge, uh, and maybe actually use circular marks leading up to that edge, and then right there, kind of sharpen it up. So again, just be careful in that negative space, because um, if your, your marks back there are, if you can really understand the direction of those marks, uh, it, could, it could bring that background forward in a way that you don't, don't really want. And actually, I'm going to so that's kind of a dangerous thing that I'm doing right there. Little red flags are popping up in my brain right now. All 
And then what happens is now that black paper, this area here starts to take on kind of a glow of light, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so what I just did right there, you see how now I have this kind of stripe of black. That's no good. That's going to flatten things out as well. I need, as I fill in this black area, I need that to be an asymmetrical shape, um, you know, not super parallel with the, the edge of that vase. Sometimes those little things can have a big impact. So now as I, it's less noticeable of a, um, of a form. Uh, I'm going to do that in here as well. Again, I want to be really careful with that. With sharper edges where I've defined them before and softer edges as I kind of travel up the inside over here onto the vase. Right here, it's a sharper edge. So just pay attention to the direction of your marks. Um, or if you're seeing a certain amount of flatness, um, check that out. So now that I've darkened this area, I have to bring some of that over onto this other side. Otherwise, it'll bring that forward. That negative space will kind of flatten things out. I'm not doing the whole paper. I'm just bringing in a few key areas. So a little bit sharper here. This is another area where I can adjust that, that curve so it's not so straight at the top like I had. And as I come around that curve, just kind of softening that edge. Being careful. Now I want to make sure, again, this black area here doesn't feel like it's a stripe around the, the vase form there. All right, so that's it for, for that area for now. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna sharpen up other areas now and then I'm gonna keep working back at it. Um, Deanna, oh, I love that you posted that. I put the detail in the vases right up front. My bad. Now I'm having issues with tone and shade. I can laugh at myself or start over. That's awesome. Go with it. I, it's just um, it's a, it's an interesting position to be in when, um, wh wh where you're, what you're talking about, and I'm kind of of two minds. Sometimes you just know you need to start over, but sometimes I like if I know a drawing is it's not going to succeed the way I wanted it to or intended it to. It can be very freeing to make up, make even more kind of tactical errors as it were. Um, just, and then you could start to experiment and go crazy with it and see what comes out of that. What is it going to reveal about the process that um, could be useful? Um, Peter Frost, I'd love to draw with Mark Crilly. That'd be great. So yeah, he's an artist that, um, here at Artist Network, we used to um, be associated with Northlight Books, and he was a big artist for us. I never met him, but yeah, that would be great. He's definitely got it figured out. Um, so just kind of softening this edge here, kind of bringing in some of the dark areas. Uh, right in here, this is a great area to refine. This the thin shadow, this point of contact here. Um, and right under here, refine this shape. I'm uh, This is the lightest of touches, really. I can just use the weight of the pencil for a lot of this stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of being a little bit careful. I want to be mindful of these edges. If I bring that the, the darkest dark right up to the edges, it it might balance things uh, in a in a weird way, and that might be something I try is to kind of experiment with. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm being mindful of that. Um, okay, 
All right, and here, uh, I think I want to bring, again, bring this, um, ultimately what I'm doing is I'm adding the black in a lot of areas where I can sharpen the edges. That That is not right at all, that curve. I have a, such a distinct angle coming out of there. And I don't know really where that came from. So you can kind of tweak it by adding, you know, kind of working both additively and subtractively. Um, in this case, it it's, it's, gets really confusing talking about additive and subtractive because now I'm adding in a subtractive way when I'm working with the black. Um, you know, I'm subtracting in an additive way <laughs> sometimes when I'm using the eraser. Uh, it gets pretty wonky. All right, and now I'm going to come back down to this vase here and refine this form a little bit. I need to look more critically at the quality of these curves now. Feather that out into this area here. Um, and while I'm doing this too, I'm starting to kind of take note of the texture of the paper, as that could come in really use, become really useful as I focus on building up the texture of the vases. So start to kind of pay attention to to that, what, what can the paper do for you? And where might you want to use the natural uh, tooth of the paper to assist you? All right, so for the opening here, this is really, really an interesting one. So it's all very subtle. The, we, this kind of bend being obscured in the reference photo is, there's an advantage and a disadvantage to that. Um, you know, there, you can practice making ellipses, and that can be really helpful. Make you know more ones, ones that are more open, some that are more uh, narrow, um, and just to really capture that that smooth curve. One of the things that um, AI had to spend a long time really practicing was not to pinch the the ovals. Um, again, because you can't really see this, it's, it's transitioning into that shadow. It gets really difficult to see what that actual, actual curve should be. Um, when we come around to this side, you can see that ellipse a little bit more clearly. Um, so just um, really kind of focus on these ends here. And if it's helpful, establish a horizontal axis across here. And it, it's similar to what I did with this, try to observe the curve relative to a straight horizontal mark. Uh, there is a tendency, I think, to draw the opening as uh, too wide, too much of an opening. Um, oftentimes, again, it's, it's similar to what we were saying earlier, that we know it to be round, and so that's going to influence our observation and our awareness of those forms. Uh, so we're, we're, again, we're fighting the optical truth with the literal truth. The literal truth is that this is a circular opening. The optical truth, given our point of view um, and the rules of perspective, as it were, since we're looking across the opening more, it's kind of squishing down into this narrow ellipse. Um, so and just kind of be kind of aware of that um, and really observe it, how close those are together, um, putting a particular emphasis on the left and the right sides. All right, so I think I've refined the edges pretty effectively. Now I can start to go through, and I think I can focus a little bit more on the uh, on the texture and really start refining this. So we're we're only you know a little over an hour in, so it's coming together pretty quickly. Um, now I think what I want to do is I'm gonna start from left to right. 
mostly because in, if my hand rubs against this, I'm not going to have to redo it. <laughs> um, but I, I generally don't worry about that too much. But in the case of the show, I'd, I want to be mindful of everyone's time and not work on something that I just have to rebuild up again later. It, it happens a lot, but it's part of the process. So I'm going to switch to my charcoal white, mostly because it's a sharper point. Um, it's just clearer, easier to work with. Um, so right out of the gate, I see we have three distinct textures between these and then this one is really interesting um, because it's hard to tell whether that's a surface texture we're looking at or an implied texture based on the glazing that's on that ceramic vase. Like it looks like it was brushed on. Um, and so we really have four distinct textures that we're working with from smooth, a little bit more texture here where you can start to see the ridges in from the, the, the throwing of the, the vase on a, on a wheel. You see that more here where you see larger ridges, um, either that's from the wheel, which I assume is from the wheel, or this is a, made from a, as a coil form. But either way, there are distinct ridges across here. Um, and then there's a rougher texture. There's some cracks. There's a layering of the glazes and paints. Um, some of that terracotta showing through over here, then it's that brush one. So I'm kind of thinking out loud as I do this to the, so that I'm moving forward with a certain amount of intention as, as I work on the, the texture. Uh, so as I come over here, I'm gonna use my blending stump just to kind of smooth things out a little bit. Uh, and that just fills, helps to fill in the tooth. And, and I can use that to soften the edge here while adding a little bit of specificity to it. And the same with here on this, just kind of lifting as I transition into that, that dark background. Now, uh, many of you who have been with me for a while have heard this, but if you're new, uh, I didn't really start using blending stumps until I started this show two years ago. <gasps> it's been almost exactly two years. I just had that realization. I think next week is, is almost exactly the two-year anniversary of the show. Um, but in the show, I started using the blending stump, and I had realized that I had a completely limited mindset to it previously. Um, you know, I, I had thought it's really only about just smoothing out the tooth of the paper, which it is one of the, the things that it does. Um, but um, I've started to appreciate how it can serve as a as a mark making tr tool. You're really you're always contributing to the form. And in here, I'm going to clean this up with the eraser. Um, I'm going to use now that again. I have my eraser kind of shaved down so the to the sharp point. Um, I can start to suggest some of these kind of horizontal lines left over from the manufacturing of, a, of this piece. I'm gonna just suggest that lightly for now. Um, and now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna I'm going to really try to refine the light. So the highlight here on this lip is right, right about here. I'm going to bear down with it on it, but it's as I'm dropping that in, I'm varying the length of the mark. So a few kind of tight ones and then gradually opening it up a little bit and then back into tight. And, and that helps to create a nice kind of gradation so it's not a sharp edge. Kind of sharpen that edge just a little bit there. And I think I do want to kind of indicate this lip a little bit more here. Okay. Now, I'm going to kind of think about this highlight here similarly. Not quite as bright as that, so I'm not putting quite as much pressure on it using these circular motions. I'm going to try to fill that in. So a little bit more pressure, kind of lightening as I move across to that edge. 
and I, as I'm doing this, I'm fluctuating my gaze a little bit. So squinting and then bringing it into focus, squinting and bringing it into focus. And when I'm squinting, what I'm trying to do is observe this overall shape. Um, and when I'm focused, then it, it gives me another kind of glance at what I'm looking at. I'm trying to understand it a little bit more clearly. Um, when I squint, again, there's this triangular quality to it, but it's got very soft edges. And, but if I'm only focusing with, you know, a, a fair amount of intent, then um, I can lose that overall shape. So by squinting, it, it helps me to kind of keep that in check a little bit more, if that makes sense. Some light horizontal lines that help to suggest the texture there. Starting with the lightest pressure possible and then just leaning in a little bit more when I need a bit more. Uh, now, one of the things to be kind of aware of is, and this can be helpful in portraiture as well. We talked about this earlier that a subject like this, when we're focusing on turning edges, um, a subject like this can be really helpful in figure drawing and portrait drawing. Um, the, the, as we're observing the light, one of the things that can be helpful to pay attention to are places where turns happen. So we have a, we have a connection of two different planes. We have this kind of spherical form here, this cylindrical form on top. The light will tend to catch a little bit more right at that point of contact, that bend. Just like on the brow of the nose, it's going to catch in here. It's going to catch on the tip of the nose, again, where it's changing those planes. Um, it's going to catch along the edge of the nose as well, where it's changing the planes across the structure of the nose. Um, so those are just kind of a few examples of how it might apply to other subjects. Uh, and then I'm, you can see I'm, I'm using my, my fingers here to stabilize, even though I'm holding the, the pencil really far back. I'm kind of putting my fingers on the paper and I'm going like this. That gives me a, a certain amount of a stability while, um, and, and control while, I, um, like, while it also allows me to be a little bit more delicate and use the side of the, the pencil a little bit more. It's a subtle glow right in here. So a circular mark right in this area. Now, if you're looking at, if you're wondering about kind of transitions and trying to make smooth gradations, again, it's multiple passes, multiple light passes is gonna benefit you more and change the direction of your marks. And each time you go, start to target the gaps in between. So if I'm going like this, that's not very smooth. Then my next pass is I'll put a little bit more pressure in those areas in between. And then that starts to smooth it out. So that, that can happen sometimes very quickly. So I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm pointing that out. Oh, I just dropped my black charcoal. Hopefully I won't need that again. All right, so now I can move over to this one. Um, be sure to, to really pay attention here to where the, the light you know, catches. Um, there's a little bit of a bend right in here where the light catches it a little bit more, so I'm gonna drop that in. Um, very complex form that you have in there, but you try to simplify it. Don't um, create more clarity here than is actually visible. Okay. Um, uh, Heather's asking what level of softness that the charcoal that I had is a 3B. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty soft one. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, you can get darker, but uh, I, I think in this circumstance, I would want as dark as I could get. All right. So now I've got right away, because I've smoothed this out a little bit more, this is becoming rougher. Um, and I want to kind of lean in on the roughness of it. I'm, so I'm not going to blend on this. But I am going to pay attention to the direction of the marks. Uh, and the edges. So um, the highlight, if I squint, and I can, I can observe the, 
the sh general shape of light as it travels down here. So you've got this area here where it's really catching the most light. So let me build up from there. I think that's probably a good idea. And uh, I'm going to be thinking a little bit about kind of the dimensional hatching, as it were. So using the marks in a way that help to address the dimension of the, the vase in this section here. So this is as a three-dimensional form. You, you have this dimension that kind of wraps up, and then you have this dimension here that wraps around. So the latitude and longitude, as it were, of, of the vase. So I'm trying to just be aware of it and let it influence the marks, but I'm not doing a whole lot of calculation around that. I'm just trying to be mindful of that as I work over here, maybe um, thinking about the way longitude marks form around the globe, for example, and then um, how it might change direction here as we move across, if that makes sense, to reinforce that, that form. Um, but I'm also going to do a lot of these circular marks uh, that are omnidirectional. So the light, uh, it's very subtle right in here, but the light kind of comes up to the edge of this, this vase over here. It's a very light value. Some of these horizontal marks I'm going to kind of drop in to suggest the, the, the finger grooves. I'm assuming, again, that, that this was thrown on a, a potter's wheel, and that's what these subtle marks are. Now, to help me with that, I'm going to use this lip here. I'm going to, going to rest it on my, my hand just to make sure that I'm roughly horizontal. And there's a little a slight curve there. Um, similar technique to what I did with that small highlight, a combination of shorter marks and getting wider, lighter pressure, wider still, and then coming back in and tighter marks and wider, kind of moving in and out with that texture to, to get it to play nicely. Um, so I've kind of over-rendered that area a little bit, but I've got an eraser that's going to help. And I'm going to bring the light around on this side just a little bit more. So this is an area where I, I just need to be um, kind of mindful of in, in a way that I was talking about the light here. We were talking about this kind of general triangular shape of light. Um, trying to observe that shape of both light and dark along this edge. And figure out exactly how aggressive I should be with that gradation of value. So softening that edge, but also, you know, making sure that that gradation makes sense. Um, uh, Jane, it's always hard to get vases and things symmetrical. You're right. You know, what forms have been really tricky for me in the past are guitars and violins. Holy smokes. Tricky forms. Um, but that's one of the reasons why vases can be so helpful to set up as a subject. It's a great way to challenge, challenge yourself. So, um, so before I bring out the eraser, you can see I'm just using my finger here to lift up some of that, that white charcoal. Thinking through the, um, thinking through the form a little bit. Again, thinking about how I can reinforce the, the volume of the vase by following the, you know, the geometry of it. And now I'm going to use this eraser, the kneaded eraser, to kind of clean it up. Now, one of the things I like about the kneaded eraser for this is that you can shape it. Um, it's it, when you're lifting with an eraser here. There's a you know you can very easily get a sharp edge, 
Um, and as I'm trying to reinforce the uh, the quality of these these ridges in the um, vase here, I want to make a soft edge. And I'm not spending a lot of time really scrutinizing here, looking and reacting, looking and reacting. Um, actually, there's some really interesting texture here. I'm just going to let let this kind of scumble across the surface. Not really matching what I'm seeing, but close. I'm kind of again, kind of reacting more in a gestural way. How do these marks change in certain areas? So what's cool about it, yeah, the kneaded erasers is you can kind of crumple it up, you get a nice rough texture. Kind of be aware, again, aware of the form of the, of the vase. Now we've talked about this before when we've talked about texture. Texture, um, from, from my perspective, is best utilized to reinforce the form of the object. If the texture overwhelms the form, then it ultimately becomes visually confusing for the viewer. So if you're looking for a hierarchy of importance, I would say light and shadow is more critical than texture. Using light and shadow to develop the form of the, the structure and then gradually refining with more texture until you're, you're satisfied with it. If you build too much texture and you lose sight of that sense of light and shadow and form, again, it, it's difficult for the viewer to make sense of it. We can understand an object and we will assign it texture that maybe we can't see, especially if, if it's hard for you to see, for example, if you forgot your glasses or in a lot of ways I just let my eyes lose focus all the time. If I've understood the form of an object through light and shadow, through understanding the, the gradual transition of into dark or the sharp transition, the quality of reflections, those types of things. If I've understood it through light and shadow, I will start to project onto it my own understanding of texture. And if we overstate that in our drawing, we're not giving the viewer really an opportunity to um, in, engage their imagination as, as it's kind of designed to. Um, and so, you know, again, it's, it's not a matter that it's not saying that you know, texture and detail is bad. It's just about how it's used. Um, and just make sure that in that hierarchy, you already are always putting value and form over texture. Now, again, that's simply my opinion. That's what's going through my head. Um, and, and it may not work for you. Um, conceptually, you may be the type of artist that wants to engage with that, that impulse or the, the reaction to things that are kind of exaggerated in terms of their texture and detail. So that's, um, that's something that's totally up to you, but I'm trying to th talk through what what I think about um, and from my sensibility. So, because for every artist, you know, for every rule there is in art, there's an artist who's done masterful things by ignoring that rule. Um, Kind of over exaggerated that changing plane there. All right, so as I'm in working in this area here, just thinking about again this change in plane, because we go from this plane, we have this underside here. I'm going to try to visualize that a little bit more, and then I'm going to drop more value here, kind of in the center of the form. Um, now there's there's that texture. There's a difference between that blue and that kind of orange of the terracotta. I'm going to ignore that. So just exactly what I was saying earlier, I want to put light and shadow um, in the hierarchy above that texture, and then I'll then I'll 
massage that texture a little bit more. Um, here on this lip, the light is catching. Again, we see a turn in plane. We have one plane on top. We're turning to another one here. That point of contact, the lights are bouncing off of it more. And I'm, I'm not going to necessarily match the, the shape of these, these glazed chips or these paint chips here or whatever is coating this face. Um, I'm going to, again, make a pass using light and shadow as the guide, see what textures emerge, and then kind of refine that, see where the drawing is naturally developing, and hopefully in a way that will in some way um, kind of serve the, the, the texture. It kind of reflects my understanding of the texture that, of this particular vase. Sharpen up this edge again with a really light touch. Uh, Heather is saying, I notice you never use any dry brushes to blend charcoal. Do you not like the result? You know, I... I don't know. I've never... It's just not something I've worked in my into my process, the idea of using brushes in charcoal. Um, so I, I've seen, I definitely have seen artists that work with it, but I, I really like using my fingers. <laughs> um, I would do that more in my oil paintings, um, but I just know how harmful that can be. So I try to keep my hands clean, but I really enjoy, I really enjoy engaging the fingers. That's what I like about working in pastel. Um, the soft, the chalk pastel, the soft pastel, not chalk, but soft pastel. All right, so again, I'm just still thinking about dimension and light and shadow, letting whatever textures emerge, reacting to some, some forms there. Uh, bring this, bring some of this down. Just rolling the pencil, kind of overlapping the, I'll, I'll punch in on that a little bit. So that's really what's happening on the surface is that I'm just letting it kind of scumble across the surface, rolling as I go, because this is not a perfectly smooth form. It's got some irregularity to it that's gonna catch on the surface and do some funky things. Um, and then if I wanna be more specific, I can and drop in a little bit more refinement along some of these forms. Some so, so something like that. That, and if you if you want to be more explicit with some of these textures, you can use your eraser to kind of drop in some little cracks there, put a little highlight along the edge if you need to. Again, I'm not really kind of matching. I'm just kind of having fun with textures to see what, you know, see what comes out. But I'm using, uh, using the, uh, the reference as a guide. So then I can pull back out here. And then hopefully it all reads effectively. Um, actually, I think I want to because I'm working kind of back and forth, additively and subtractively. Sorry, I'm getting a little, little in my head at the moment, so I'll try to keep talking here, but... Oh, there's this cool little kind of gash right in here that it's, it stays kind of in that shadow. So I want to be really careful with that subtle as much as I can. Um, and so the light's coming in from this direction. So what you might expect is actually the shadow to be on top. 
of that little highlight. So it's kind of coming across and catching on the, the back, the lip on the back side of that, that gash. Uh, and in here, there's a little pit right in here that, again, catching light. And now, as you're as you're thinking about form, and you're working with the texture, um, what will help you to reinforce that sense of form is to observe how marks become more open in the center, more closed at the edge. They really kind of squish together as you wrap around. So as you as you're thinking about these forms, think about just tightening them up at the edges and opening them up as you get into the center more. Uh, right now, I'm just using the, the eraser more to blend than anything. Um, I think I'm going to move over to the handle, try to refine that handle. I just want to be mindful of everybody's time because we're coming up on two hours. Um, nice little form right in here. I'll kind of drop in some of that light where there's some kind of chunky clay. So again, we'll, we've got to remember back to what we observed before about where the harder edges are. Uh, so they're kind of right in here along the top of that form. But the brightest spot is here more towards the center of the form. So I'm going to lay down a little bit more pressure. Something like that. Um, and then here, this section of the vase is, is kind of wrapped around. If you, if you look at this in the reference photo, but you look at this section, but put your awareness on that highlight, it helps you to become aware of how, how bright to actually make that. If you just look at that handle, there, there could be a tendency of overstating it. And we want to be, so you want to be, just be careful with that. Um, the, you know, the, I'm just using a really light pressure here. And kind of tweak that edge a little bit more. That feels a little bit too intense, so I'm just going to use my finger to kind of lift up there a little bit. So now, I'm as I observed in the reference photo, I'm going to I'm going to flip that now. I'm going to put my awareness on this part of my drawing, um, you know, focus on this part of the drawing, but but think about this to see to make sure that there's a shift in value, so that I if and vice versa, I'll look here. But put my, put my awareness over there to make sure that I'm I'm thinking properly. Take a little bit more texture down in here. Um, all right, thank you, everybody. Yeah, I can't believe we're at almost two years. Wow, I, I yeah, didn't really even think of that. Okay, here now onto this face. We've got a little bit of light kind of catching in here. Uh, so I'm going to drop that in with kind of a different type of mark because the, um, the texture of that, of that clay is a little bit different there. Um, I might give a little bit more kind of punch to that inside of the... I'm using those vertical marks to hopefully suggest a little bit more verticality to that. And then he, right in here is where the that highlight comes in, but it's not super bright. Hopefully it's bright enough. We have got it. Um, and then as I come down in here, now this is the smoothest of the vases, so I'm going to really use the, the blending stump for this. 
It's a really fun exploration of texture. Um, that's, you know, one of the things that, you know, kind of getting back to texture and, and form is, is one of the things that really jumped out for me is when I, when it clicked that ultimately all texture is, is an expression of light and shadow, right? It's, it's all about the light. You know, we understand things to be more kind of reflective um, with, with sharper um, highlights and shadows, uh, more matte surfaces are, you know, have smoother gradations, less intense highlights. Um, you know, there's just, again, just observing that transition from light to shadow, the quality of the highlights, the quality of the shadow says so much about the texture. So I'm just building this up, smoothing it out, um, really trying to make it noticeably smoother than uh, the other pots there. Um, but I think that's that's probably good for now. I don't think I necessarily got it 100% right, but hopefully you get the idea. And then on to this one. This is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to simulate that that kind of brushed on look and the texture there between the blue and the black of the vase. Um, all right, let's think through this. I'm just going to start playing. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to switch up to this this kind of vertical orientation. And you can see by just dragging along the length of the the pencil there, you can, and rolling it in your fingers so that they're you're you're not flattening out any areas, you can start to create some interesting texture. I'm going to see what happens if I use this sharp eraser. Maybe not quite sharp enough. But that's starting to create that brushed on feel. And just be careful when you're working on there not to create stripes. We talked about that before in the show. It's irregularity is the key, not an evenly spaced sequence of stripes. So I'm just trying to pay attention to the, the direction of these marks and how they might be changing as it flows around the, the form because there's a, an irregularity to that glazing. And I'm varying it between dragging and then pushing the charcoal. Sharper line there. And right as I'm working in this area, I don't really understand the form. So I just have to trust the abstraction. Uh, I'm going to do a quick check in with the symmetry of this form. I want to visualize the central axis. Now it's because of the, the pattern. Um, on the on the face here, it's um, it's difficult to see it as a symmetrical form. All right, there's this shadow under here, and then this subtle glow here on this this lip, really kind of fading that out to the left and the right sides. And now let's see, I'm going to give a little bit more texture down in here. You know, thinking through the, the volume of the vase list a little bit. Um, now, as 
in looking at the form here, you know, it looks like we have like a, a thin kind of dark line kind of on either side of that white. So what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to you know, erase out a wide dark area and I'll do that down here as well. And then what I'll do is I'll come back in here, um, and instead of instead of using an overhand grip, I'm going to intentionally use I mean a, a tripod grip. I'm going to intentionally use this overhand grip. Uh, it just reads more like a naturally formed line than um, the tripod grip. It, I just wanted to kind of stick to the form a little bit more. I'm not being precise with this, I'm just trying to capture the overall essence. So it's just really the lightest touch that I can give to this. Um, now we've got these zigzag patterns. And there's kind of, you're going to be mindful of the fact of two things. There's, there's straight lines, but they're also moving over a curvilinear surface. So it's not just a straight line. It kind of rounds out this way, and then it changes direction here. Um, I'm going to do the same thing here, just kind of tapping along the edge. If I make these lines really read as lines, the if I switch over to this grip and I draw a line, the the danger in that is that the viewer could the viewer's mind could then interpret that as a as a, as an edge, a contour line, which would be confusing because a, the edge of an object shouldn't exist. These are forms that are on uh, the uh, on that that form on that object. not edges. Again, that's where the texture should reinforce the form. So um, how are we doing? We're almost almost at two hours. Kind of feel like I rushed through that last part, but hopefully it hopefully it works for you. Um, hopefully this has been helpful. I want I do want to get back to some of the questions. I've kind of ignored that a little bit, got kind of sucked into the drawing. Um, so let's see. Mad Moments Go saying, using your finger and a blending stump, um, two is better than one. Absolutely. I just, yeah, I kind of use whatever. Um, you know, I've, I actually, sometimes I like to use actually the, the, this part of the wood here. If I, if I, if I place it down and the, the, you know, the, you can see that the white core is off the paper and you can kind of scratch that surface and, and create some really interesting um, patterns there. Uh, it's not doing a whole lot there, but, you know, just play around with whatever makes marks. The more experimentation, the better. Um, and I say make as many bad drawings as you can. Um, all right. Yeah, so instead of what I said earlier about textures lifting the subject off the paper, it's ultimately light and shadow and contrast that's doing it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Ania is asking a question. Is, it, is working on black paper more difficult or less difficult than working on white or toned paper? You know, I think it's ultimately what is difficult, what reads as difficulty is, you know, when it has more to do with kind of mental understanding, right? So... This becomes less difficult the more you do it, just like anything else, right? And that's why I think it's such a valuable exercise to shake it up because it just gives you more tools at your disposal. And it gives, it gives you a, a way of, of looking at the subject through another lens. Um, and it just it can deepen your appreciation of certain things like light and shadow and texture 
Um, so it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily more difficult. In this way, it was actually easier for me because there's so much dark in the scene. And, and so to really, it forces you to um, you know, think about it in terms of light and shadow. And it can be easier in some ways because you, you, you can arrive at an understanding of three-dimensional form through light and shadow a little bit more quickly this way sometimes than on a white paper where you might have to build it up more. So working both, um, you know, in both ways can be really helpful in the long run. And that's why we kind of challenge ourselves um, because that's how we grow. So um, hopefully that makes sense. But yeah, this is a lot of fun. It can be very satisfying. Another satisfying process is Scratchboard. Um, and so if you can buy a sheet of Scratchboard or you can actually make your own, um, you can um, use acrylic gesso, you know, cover over a sheet of paper and then paint like a, an India ink on top of that and then scratch through the surface, you know, scratch through the ink to ex reveal the, um, not, I'm sorry, not a gesso. I think it works better with an acrylic paint. Um, so it doesn't have as much of the binding kind of quality to it. Um, and it kind of scratches off a little bit more easily. You can actually play around with paint colors and put India ink on top of it and then scratch through. It's a lot of fun. Um, so I want to thank you all for being with me. Um, I think that's it for the day. I got to get moving on to something else. But again, I want to thank you all for being with me today. Next week, we'll be working on a portrait, a uh, profile portrait, actually a strong sense of light and shadow. So we'll learning from this and applying that to a portrait and I might actually do this on do it on black paper as well um, just but I'm kind of thinking about it well we'll see what happens um, but so switching gears to portraiture um, and then we do have more in the art of the steel series we'll be working with a Van Gogh coming up so for the month of April we'll have Van Gogh as our master copy that we're gonna be working on um, I'd love to see your work if you've been drawing along or even if it has nothing to do with this there's a link in the description below where you can share your work when you're done. Check out my book. It's called See, Think, Draw. It's on Amazon right now. So it's coming out uh, for print in June. So you can pre-order it at this point. Um, so I love seeing all the familiar names. I uh, love seeing all the work. We're going to meet again next Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. 